Good. Alrighty. Okay. Alright, ready? Okay. You got your cam, lily cams on? Nope. Yep, lily cams on. Everything's good. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, you know, all the talk is about measles, 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 measles. So what I thought I would do is talk about COVID to start with, just to set the stage. So there's an interesting um, commentary in the New York Times that I, I thought was interesting. And I think it, it explains a lot of what's going on with measles. So this is uh, the, what was excess deaths during COVID. And so what you can see is that, uh, you know, 1.2 million people died and that having COVID roughly doubled your risk of dying. And there are sort of many responses to this. And, and if you were a physician or in the healthcare field or over the age of 65, this was a very scary event because it was really life-threatening. Uh, but if you think back on it, uh, a, a terrible disease like COVID early on that caused anywhere between 1% and 3% death, uh, mortality rate, that means 97% of people who got infected lived. And so there were kind of two responses to seeing all this excess death. And one is really happy that there was a vaccine that was available that might prevent you from having this experience. Or a lot of people resented the fact that we had lockdowns and all this stuff to try to prevent this. And so I think what you're seeing in the country is diametrically opposed views. So I'm very grateful that the vaccine was available to help you. And many like really angry that they had to experience years of being locked down and they either got it or didn't get a vaccine and were fine. So I think that's what's playing out. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand it because to me, I mean, it makes sense just to get your vaccinated, but not everybody feels that way. So uh, just to follow up on the SARS-CoV-2 story, uh, there's not a lot of SARS, uh, or it's a kind of moderate in the nation right now, and you can see it's beginning to, it's, it's, it's moderate in that there's a lot of SARS around, but that it's beginning to, to come down. And it really, it really hasn't evolved much. I've been showing this before. XEC is no longer the dominant strain, but LP81, which is closely related, is so it hasn't evolved much. So uh, any immune response you have, either through vaccination or having been infected by it, is still very uh, going to be appropriate for the current strains that are circulating. Um, and nationally or internationally, this is the Travelers Program. You can see internationally it's beginning to come down as well. So the reason I started off with talking about how people have diametrically opposed views of vaccination is I think it plays out in the measles concern. I've said many times before, measles is one of the most highly infectious uh, viruses around. Uh, nine out of 10 people who are exposed will be infected if they are susceptible, in other words, if they haven't been vaccinated. The reason, the, uh, the, because the R number is so high, you have to have 95% of the population vaccinated to prevent outbreaks from happening. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind. So the big outbreaks are mostly in Texas now. <laughs> this is just blatant advertising for Baylor College of Medicine. If you look where the outbreak is, it's in West Texas. And blue represents where all the Baylor physicians are. So you'll happen to notice what's going on in West Texas. Now, if we have more Baylor physicians here, maybe that would... <laughs> I'm just kidding on that. And, but, uh, and by the way, our friends at Texas Tech who are providing the position base, I'm sure they're very involved with this. If you look at you, share of U.S. kindergartners vaccinated against measles, it was about where we need to be, 95% until COVID happened. And then look what happened post-COVID. So that's interesting because clearly there was a mindset change, uh, and it wasn't across the board. So if you look at, there's some states that had dramatic reductions. So here is pre-pandemic levels, uh, as you can see, and, uh, and this is the U.S. average, which needs to be at 95%. So pre-pandemic, we were at about 95%, and the yellow bar represents how we've moved from 95% down to below levels nationally that would prevent outbreaks. But some states really moved down, like Idaho is down to 80%, Alaska 85%, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Colorado, all very very uh, getting worse, whereas Kansas, Alabama, Maine, Connecticut have all moved up. 
And again, it should, this should not be a partisan issue, and yet this, the states that uh, voted mostly for Democrats didn't really change much, and the, the share of uh, kindergartens with a vaccine exception increased mostly in those that are Republican states, so, or, or who voted that way in the last election. So again, this should not be, this should be a fact-based point, and yet it's not. So I've heard our uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services say, if there was evidence that measles vaccine was safe and effective, they'd be very supportive of that. Well, uh, let's talk about that because there's probably no better evidence for any vaccine than measles. Um, probably since 1963, there have been probably close to a billion vaccines given. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated. The WHO estimates that just in the last 15 years, probably 17 million lives have been saved because of that. So if you look at what the impact of measles is, if there are 10,000 people who contract measles, one in five of those people gets hospitalized. So that would be 2,000 hospitalizations. 500 children would get pneumonitis, pneumonia, uh, and that's the main cause of death. But even worse than that, about a thousand children would have ear infections that would lead to permanent hearing loss. And I know many children in my age group that that got had hearing loss as a result of uh, of uh, measles. And ten of those cases in ten thousand would have uh, encephalitis and very serious uh, uh, complications. Now look at ten thousand people who get the MMR vaccine. Three in ten thousand would get a fever and had complications, fever, mostly seizure disorder. Three in 10,000, and less than one in 100,000 would have an allergic reaction. So based on the severity of the disease and the safety of the vaccine, there's absolutely no reason in my book why this isn't the safest and most efficacious vaccine around. So I'm not sure what we're waiting for, because there's plenty of evidence already on, on close to a billion vaccines given. So let's look at the Texas measles outbreak. Uh, there was a in, recent NBC news story on the fact that they looked at people who, whose kids were infected and they said, now in Lubbock, they're vaccinating multiple kids that have never been vaccinated before because families didn't believe in vaccines. But now they're getting vaccinated because there's this measles outbreak. And about a half, uh, approximately half of the 100 doses of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, MMR, given by the health department, were given to kids who were unvaccinated. So we're clearly failing to educate the folks in the, our country about the importance of vaccines. And frankly, I don't think in my elementary school education or middle school or high school, we even talked about uh, things like vaccination or public health. And so somewhere we, we're going to have to change that. So people wonder, well, how does measles get here? You know, how we're we're all safe. Well, as I say all along, you know, you can't. You have to. You have to think of the world as one giant uh, population because you can't prevent viruses from moving around. Just just the other day, JFK uh, had a four, it had a big alert because a child was brought in who entered the country on China Airlines who, who tested positive for measles. But after arriving at JFK, she had a febrile illness, no one was, was sure what, what, what was wrong with her, traveled on a shuttle bus to Philadelphia, visited two clinics, and eventually was diagnosed with measles. Well, think of how many people who were exposed along the way, not only in the, in the airplane, in the buses, in the shuttles, in the emergency rooms, uh, you know, and, and officials are now struggling to, like, find all the cases that are available. In Austin, there was a, a case, in Austin, Texas, a case of measles in an unvaccinated infant who was exposed on a vacation overseas. So if you leave the country, you might be exposed. If people come to the country from foreign travel, they might be exposed. So that's how, the, that's how the, it gets into the country. So, you know, it's always that we can't protect ourselves unless the country is 95% vaccinated. And so we, we've just got to do a better job. Well, let's talk a little bit about the flu. Uh, it's been a really tough flu season, actually. Uh, flu is still elevated in the country, but it's beginning to come down. This is going to be classified as a high severity uh, flu season, the highest since 2017. Uh, and this is the highest cumulative hospitalization rate we've had uh, since 2010. Uh, the CDC is currently estimating 37 million cases 
uh, of uh, flu, 480,000 hospitalizations, and 21,000 deaths from flu this season, including 98 pediatric deaths. Uh, and the CDC continues to recommend that er everybody over the age of six months or older should be getting a flu vaccine. Um, don't forget, there are, you know, antivirals out there like Tamiflu available for people who are at risk who get infected. And interestingly enough, there have been no new H5N1 vaccine, bird flu uh, uh, infections in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we got a question I asked, or answered, uh, I think, two weeks ago on when does the flu season end. Well, if you look at the peak flu season from 1982 to 2024, you can see generally February is the peak month, begins to come down in March and coming down in April, and we're following that trend right now. If you look at the CDC reported uh, clinical laboratories, you can see it's beginning to come down now. Uh, hospitalization rates are finally beginning to come down, but they've been pretty bad particularly in those um, uh, uh, elderly patients. And when we talked about it being a bad season, this is mortality. You can see the mortality in each of the past two years, and we're, our peak of mortality is much higher uh, than it's been. I like to end always with TEFI, being our Texas Epidemic uh, Public Health Institute. Uh, it reflects, actually, if this is wastewater analysis, so influenza B and influenza A still high in the, in the wastewater analysis. It's interesting, RSV A and B are high in Texas, but in the rest of the nation, it's beginning to fall. Uh, norovirus is still around, and Parvo-19 is still high. Uh, coronavirus in Texas is pretty low, but increasing. So that's the, that's the state of our, our infectious disease health uh, for this past week. So I want to end today with some shout outs, first of all, on March 4th, we observed COVID Heroes and Memorial Day, a day established by the Texas State Legislature to honor the extraordinary efforts of healthcare providers, first responders, and essential workers who faced the challenge of the pandemic. And, and uh, it's hard to remember, I mean, this is almost an out-of-body experience thinking back to those three years and, uh, from, I mean, when they started the pandemic, it's, not, it's hard to even believe it happened. A lot of people are in denial that it ever happened, actually. Uh, but it's, a, it's, you know, there are 95,000 Texans who lost their lives due to COVID, so uh, it, it impacted us pretty significantly. I also want to thank uh, or congratulate Dr. Uh, Nevin Ethan, Professor of Medicine at Baylor and Chief of the Renal Section at the BKBA, who received the prestigious uh, Garibet Eknoyan Award from the National Kidney Foundation. This award recognizes an individual who has promoted the mission of the National Kidney Foundation in making lives uh, better for people with kidney disease. And then finally, this week, our medical students presented the research in the categories of basic science education, health system science, and clinical disciplines in the 25th Annual Henry J. N. Taub and James uh, K. Alexander Medical Student Research Symposium. This uh, symposium gives medical students an opportunity to present their research and discuss their findings with other Baylor students and faculty. And many thanks to the students and faculty who participated in this research, a very important part of uh, healthcare delivery. You can't make advances in healthcare without doing research. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.